Nope, nope. I'm use, I use my own. Okay. Well, I'm delighted to be here today, and um, the reason you haven't heard about this very much before, if at all, is because this is a new system, and it just got launched in um, November. We had done six months of solid testing. We had worked with Dr. Hageman in his lab to help with the testing last fall. Um, but it's just being rolled out, and of course with the holidays and everything else, it's catching up now, getting a lot to see, uh, steam. We are teaching all of the medical students to use this as part of one of their third year rotations. And Steve was in one of the first um, cohorts of uh, us teaching the, the medical students, and he's, he's really a huge proponent, and we have other folks who are also huge proponents of it as we go farther. The um, FARTA system is, uh, stands for Federated Utah Research and Translational Health Electronic Repository. Um, and its purpose is to support clinical and translational research. It joins data from multiple sources. It is for retrospective study, although people are saying they could use it in prospective studies. For example, when they have a clinical trial going, they can look on an ongoing basis to say how many more patients have come in that I could then contact to <coughs> enroll in my clinical trial. So it's, uh, it's got a lot more uh, capability uh, depending upon your curiosity and your ability to search it. And we also have ongoing uh, work that's happening as we, as we work on it. Um, this is all being done under uh, my hat, not as department chair in biomedical informatics, which is a department in the School of Medicine, but in my associate vice president hat, where Dr. Betts asked me um, about four years ago, would I please take on this role and work to, as one of my very top priorities, make clinical data accessible to the research community. So this is actually a lot of hard work under the hood to make all of this match up and make sure we're querying the right sources and, and it matches up with the uh, electronic medical record folks and the UPDB, but it's a fairly simple front end. Uh, it doesn't do everything you want, it gets you started and I think that's, that's the big thing. So the current state is this aggregate count across data sources for pre-research questions uh, and unique incommentations across these data sources. Uh, it is new, as I said, and really the reason that you do cohort searching, as Barbara was saying, is that it's the, it's the way you start saying, do I have a big enough patient population that will match my criteria? Um, nationally, there have been studies which show that about 60% of clinical trials um, fail to enroll <laughs> enough patients to <coughs> complete what they anticipated would be an adequate patient number to finish their study. And we did a study here at uh, the University of Utah, looking over five years of past retrospective data at the IOB, and 75% of the studies here were either delayed or did not fulfill their requirements for getting enough patients in their cohort. Some portion of that is because people have not had access to figuring out what are the right criteria to ask for as I, as I go forward. So we are sitting, we did this originally because of the CTSA, Clinical and Translational Science Awards. Those are large national awards. Um, we have one here at the University of Utah. There are about 60 medical schools who have them. Um, and that award sits in the middle of our Center for Clinical and Translational Studies. As part of this, we envisioned being able to search not only University of Utah hospitals and clinical uh, clinic patients, but also Huntsman Cancer Institute patients, Intermountain Healthcare, VA, which is the Utah Department of Health, and other partners as we go forward. Um, and saying uh, we have such data resources here in um, the Utah area, let's search across <laughs> all of them. And uh, we are in the process of doing that and across more than just clinical data, but also genotypes, phenotypes, public health data, and pedigree data. Um, 
And we probably have more of all of this combined in Utah than anywhere else in the United States. But it's hard to get access to. So right at the moment, we have two data sources that you can search from your desktop, and I'll show you some of these today. So first of all, it's the Electronic Data Warehouse, which sits at the University of Utah. We have data back to 1994, 1.5 million patients, lab results, medical orders, diagnoses, and procedures. And um, so when you search, you're searching across all of these records of 1.5 million patients. Um, and then uh, sometime in the month of March, we're adding encounters. And because of all of the new EPIC systems, we're bringing in all the clinics data in the encounters, so there will be a whole host of new things. So it changes all the time and will be bigger. And then we're searching across the UPDB limited database. That's Utah population database. That's got <coughs> six and a half million individuals, um, goes into hospital claims data across the state. 96 to present, gets you into cause of death, death certificates. These sit in the vital statistics registry at the state of Utah um, in their Department of Health. Birth certificates, pedigree quality, and has a master subject index that they've developed in, in that group over, over the years, which is pretty amazing. As they link all of these records together, you want to know, are these unique patients? Do, do these records belong to the same patient or are these different patients. So they've worked pretty hard to develop that and we um, use that in our further as searching across these sources to say well, who is the unique patient and which ones are, are duplicative. Uh, right now the, the, we use it particularly across the University and the Mountain to help make sure we know who's, who, which is the unique patient. Uh, and we're, we're working to bring in our Mountain live but it's not live yet. So what happens, you can get online. Has anybody in here searched UPDBL? Uh, one person, I, uh, two people. I think that it's a very useful resource, and if you're especially you're, you're looking at these data sources and only these data sources, um, then I certainly recommend you get on there, and, it, and it's very useful for cohort planning. Um, but what further does is search all of the UPDBL and the EDW data on top of that, gets you cohort statistics, and then it does not right now get you record level patient data. It may or may not in the future. And the reason it may or may not is because the IRB is watching us pretty closely and making sure what we're doing is totally HIPAA compliant and in line with regulations. So right now what you have to do is to take these um, patient counts that you see, and when you finally fiddle with all of these parameters to say these are increase in exclusion criteria for my cohort, then I'm going to take it, I will write an IRB, I will get permission to do it, and then you pull that data, and, uh, and right now you have to go back to the UPDB and the EDW to jointly pull that data, get yourself a set of data and work with it from that point on because at that point it's identified and IRB has approved it. The um, environment is, um, we use a system that I'll show you the query tool, the front end query tool, it's called I2B2. It's a query tool which has been developed by Harvard. They have a national center for um, uh, biomedical computing assistance for the country. And they've developed this uh, front end query tool which is pretty zippy actually. It doesn't do everything you want, but that's where we're starting. As I said, we have two data sources. We federate by patient ID, aggregate queries, some union and intersection, and these, these data sites, data types. So here's the, um, here's what it looks like. And I put the URL right up there. So you can get online at any time you want to further.utah.edu and you start over here and it says register for an account and that's the very first thing you do and anybody who has a UID can register for an account. Um, you have to wait after you register to get an email back saying we confirm your registration so it doesn't take too long but you can't just immediately 
jump in, you'll have to wait a little while to get an email confirmation. And then you can start querying. Um, and um, I will do some querying in just a moment. But I have to tell you, once you pull it up, you, you need to read this data use agreement. The data use agreement is uh, IRB has said, please make sure this on there. And you can't get an account until you agree that you'll do it. Now, that's kind of like, you know, all the time on my laptop, I'm always downloading things and saying, I agree, I agree, I agree. But this is pretty important that the information I have provided, it's really you doing the searches. And, um, and they, they want you to use this data to provide information for proposals or project development preparatory to conducting your research. So it's not meant to be frivolous, but it is, it is a pre-research uh, pre tool. The biggest thing is I will not attempt to identify any individual represented in the query system. And um, we have gone through all kinds of statistical um, rules and regulations to make sure that what you see are large numbers. You'll see asterisks in various places. And that means if you choose, a, a, if you have a cell which is five or fewer, it won't tell you it's five or fewer, gives you an asterisk because they feel like if you do a series of queries, you can start identifying people and the IRB and our regulation folks don't like that at all. So I'm going to um, get online here and I'm, I'm gonna do diabetic cataract. I talked to Barb ahead of time and she gave me some clues as to what might make sense, so I've done several of them. So let me orient you just a little bit to the screen. You, uh, this is where you do your query, and this is how you find your terms. You also have a list of previous queries and a workplace where you can save everything you do. The previous queries will save for maybe a week or two, but you'll lose them. If you want to save them, you have to drag them up and save them. Um, and I'm gonna do it by finding terms. And this is simply something which says um, search by names and this contains. Now you could do other than contains, but this is um, pretty good. So I'm gonna diabetic uh, cataract. And uh, I'm gonna say find that. And uh, there's diabetic cataract gives me, it is searching now by ICD-9 code. And um, you can take that and drag it over here. And um, you could do more queries. Um, so this is, if you put more and more in here, it's, uh, it would be diabetic cataract or macular degeneration or something, you could look for all of those. And if you do it across these groups, it's and. But I'm just going to run this query with the single um, source and I say I'm going to say tell me who is in the Enterprise Data Warehouse or the UPDB Limited with those uh, you, who has diabetic cataract. And now it's, um, it's running and it didn't change the screen <laughs> resolution so it doesn't fit all on one screen as well as it did before, but maybe it does on that one. So down here it's executing the query, and it'll tell you uh, how many seconds, and I do have to say that you have to be careful when you do this, because sometimes you'll launch a query that takes a long time. This is not a system which is like um, when you're using Effort or Cerner, and you, you're not seeing patients when you do this. You're sitting at your desk and you're thinking, I wonder how many pa diabetic cataract patients you have. And so you, um, you don't, you're not in a patient care situation. You're in a, I'm contemplating my research situation. And while it's doing that, I wanna show you some other things that are up uh, higher, which is, uh, I have to move my screen around. Up here, you can go to a help screen.
screen, which will give you um, all kinds of assistance introducing it, but the help videos I think are quite useful. I would start there, overview or how you select terms or building a query, and I think that they're really quite useful for helping you get started. Um, this tells you about the analysis tools, and um, I'll show you how to do that um, in just a moment, how you use previous queries in your workplace. And uh, definitely says that I2D2 uh, comes from Harvard Medical School, and um, but we did some modifications and we're uh, using this here. So let me um, close that out. And um, okay, so it's it has uh, completed the query. This is the. Uh, the only one I'm really going to run live, I have some saved ones so that uh, you can see them a little bit better and blow them up. But down here it has executed your query. It took 120 seconds to do that, so it took two minutes. And it searched across six and a half million records in all of the ICD codes. Um, it found that you've got um, 1223 patients and um, that most of them are in the EDW. So you've got diabetic cataract in that many patients and you have to say, is that enough to do a study or not? It's a pretty big, pretty big number. It only found 34 of them in the UPDB. Um, but of th and there's nine patients in common between the two. So unique patients, there's 1248. Let me show you how you could say, tell me a little bit more about those patients. And that's um, up here in analysis tools. And it says load a plugin. Well, we only have one plugin. And it's a demographics plugin right now. And I'm going to. Um, Okay, you take your results. It's not uh, plugging in. There it is. That's why I did a lot of. Uh, yeah, no, it's, I don't know what it is. I tell you what, I'm going to not do any more on that, and I will um, show you my. What you'll, first of all, I, I decided to compare diabetic cataract. We found 1,000, 1,020, wait a minute. Well, I don't know what it was. Anyway, we found some. But if, in fact, instead of that, you were going to do diabetes and cataract together, so you could search diabetes mellitus and cataract, then what you find is 10,000. Um, and my suggestion, if you were going to do a study, is that not only would you want to find those people who with a definite diagnosis of diabetic cataract, but you would also want to look at that other group in order to see maybe there were some with diabetic cataract who weren't actually given that specific di diagnosis, but they have um, the... Um, they've got both of those diagnoses together and maybe you've got a larger group than you saw before. So what, what you see over here is that you would, all I did was just choose cataract. I chose the entire group of cataract 366, um, drug it over there and did this uh, particular query. And, and then you can 
see how many new patients do you have along the way and how many patients in common. Um, let me go up. Where is visually acuity? Yes, you could query anything which is um, coded over here. So um, you could say, uh, you could add that um, to your query list and, uh, and you can, if in fact you have a new group, you could keep adding things to your query list. So it doesn't just have to be three. Could be five, six, or seven. Um, and you can search for other things as well. And I've got some examples of that. I think what I did was to uh, load your, um, well, here's a glaucoma example that goes on for several of them. So I chose glaucoma over here, queried that, and then I added to that with how many do you have with organic sleep apnea and glaucoma. And um, what you find here is uh, that you've got 160 patients in the UPDB, 465 in the EDW, uh, unique patients. You've got 605 of them. Now, um, submitting that and then going forward, I added some more things to it. I said there's other kinds of sleep apnea, unspecified sleep apnea, hypersomnia with sleep apnea, insomnia with sleep apnea. So you can find other diagnoses to add and then you can, you can ask it in age categories. In this particular case I said between the ages of 30 and 89, those are demographic age categories. Um, and took longer to run, but what you found is 308 here in, uh, well, 308 in, in the UPDB-L, 806 here in the data warehouse, um, and uh, 1,075 patients overall. Now, if you got your, if, if the demographic plug-in had worked, this is kind of what you would see. So it, first of all, um, looks at how many, what are your patient sum total, unique patients, patients common to all sources in this particular query. So that was the glaucoma and uh, sleep apnea query. Two sources responded to that, et cetera. And here's your age distribution. Um, you do have some younger patients going back to 35 with that. Um, and um, it will also tell you the pedigree quality. This is, of course, being pulled from the UPDB. So if you're wanting to say, does this run across uh, generations, you've got 109 multi-generation pedigrees that have that in there, and you can certainly use that to uh, think about this a little bit more. Um, it also, it, I mean, it, there is missing data along the way. And then here's an other, and you'll see the asterisk just says it's five or less in the other category, and therefore you can't answer it. it tells you race, uh, religion, male, female, deceased, which let me go back up and say, deceased comes from the vital records, uh, vital status deceased. So that comes from the state vital records. And then this looks at patients in common over all data sources. So that's the UPDB and the EDW both and uh, gives you once again the data uh, related to that. Now in this particular case, unless you're interested in those, those pedigree um, data, then I would suggest that you just go to the EDW and find it because you're not going to find that much in, in the UPDB. Here's another one, senile macular degeneration and um, anti-hyperlipidemic drugs. Barbara said, how about statins? And what I decided to do was two queries, one of which was um, looking at the drug. So I was over here looking at medication order, pulled uh, anti-hyperlipidemic agents, and um, this gave me uh, 1,067 patients, but I want you to note, particularly it says negative one in UPDB, and negative one is our symbol which says I can't find anything because it can't search this data source. UPDB doesn't have 
prescription medications. It doesn't have drugs. So it simply says, um, if you want a, a query to find this kind of patients in the UPDDL, you can't search it this way. You'll have to search it and not have drugs come up. Um, but then I, I decided I would compare, if you just looked at statins, how many you'd find. So it found, uh, well, let me go back to this one. With antihyperlipidemic, it found uh, 1,067 patients. And if you look at searching it with just statins, here's your breakdown of within the, the antihyperlipidemic agents. You've got um, a, a bunch of them, which come in along the way, all of these different kinds. And Here's all your statins, HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, um, and you find 115. So for most of the patients who are on um, anti-hyperlipidemic drugs, most of them are on statins. Um, and you find 1,015 patients. Once again, you can say, um, you know, what's the age range? Barbara was saying you think that there might be a protective um, effect to statins and you, it, this tells you how many patients you would have and then you would have to figure out what to compare it to. This is, this doesn't do your whole experiment with you uh, or for you. It says now let me think about what do I compare it to uh, to see if the incidence is higher or lower. Um, and I think I've almost run out of time, about two minutes. But this is what you do next, register for an account. Um, Start querying, check out the help videos, email for assistance to further at, e at utah.edu, send me comments and use it. It really can help you with your research and it'll grow as we go forward. So thank you very much. Well, we, we are working on specific electronic communication with the IRB, but that isn't here yet. That'll come soon. I don't know about soon. It'll come in several months, probably. The IRB, what you can do is to print out those further screens, and you can uh, talk specifically about your query. And when you queried uh, the EDW and the UPDBL, you found the following cohort numbers. <coughs> and then write your IRB around it. And um, you then you have to get both IRB and RGE approval. RGE if you want any data coming from UPDBL. And then that has to be pulled for you by the EDW team or UPDB team. Um, we hope in the future the IRB will be comfortable with our system pulling the data once we hear that you got an IRB, but that's not here yet either. I, the IRBs are um, just taking it as slow and we're still developing the system, so. It's just, what we've had people say is it cuts about three months off the front end of their cohort development cycle to figure all of this stuff out uh, at their desk, nights, weekends, and get their research um, assistants also working with it along the way. That still has to happen. If you're just searching EDW, then you don't have to pull data from the UPDB. You just have to go to the EDW team and pull data from them. So, so that's not across multiple incidents. 